Good morning and welcome to the committee's 13th meeting in 2019. Could I ask everyone pleasant, present please to make sure your mobile phones are on silent. Uh, we have apologies from Colin Smith and Rhoda Grant is attending uh, as a substitute member. Rhoda, just for the record, I know you've been on the committee before, but could you declare any interests at this stage before uh, we go any further? I don't think I have any interests that um, impact on the committee, but I am a member of Unison and the Co-op Party. OK, thank you very much, Rhoda, and, um, and welcome. The first agenda item is, on, uh, is an agriculture and fisheries update, and this is an opportunity for the committee to receive updates from the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Scottish Government officials on a range of matters relating to agriculture and fisheries management. Now, before I welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary and his team, I would just like to ask members of the committee if there are any declarations of interest they have in relation to this subject, and I would like to open it to say that I am a member of a farming partnership. I'd likewise say, tell the committee that I am also a member of a farming partnership. Uh, Stuart. Uh, I have a very small registered agricultural holding. Okay, fine. Therefore, I'd like to formally welcome Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy. I'd like to welcome Alan Gibb, the acting Deputy Director of Sea Fisheries. I'd like to welcome Mike Palmer, the Di Deputy Director of Agriculture, Crown Estate, Recreational Fisheries, EMFF and Europe. Uh, Andrew Watson, the Deputy Director for Agricultural Policy Implementation. David Barnes, uh, the National Advisor on Agricultural Policy. And John Kerr, the Head of Agricultural Policy Division for the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make an opening statement of no more than three minutes, please? Yes, uh, good morning, Convener and members. Um, by mid-March this year, it looked like the UK would crash out of the UK without a deal on the 29th of March. As late as the 10th of April, the UK could have crashed out two days later. The UK government has now secured a, a longer extension, but this has only delayed the risks. The problems have therefore not been solved, but deferred. The impasse at Westminster remains. The Scottish government believes the way to break it is by a people's vote, but the UK government continues to resist that. The Prime Minister still hopes to deliver her deal, a deal which we can't support given the grave impacts it could have on Scotland, but no deal remains a very real risk. Exit day could be before the European Parliament elections, or at the beginning of June, or at the end of October, or at any other date before or after. You, you could hardly make things less certain if you tried. So the risks of a no-deal exit have not convener, gone away. Our exports could be blocked due to tariff or non-tariff barriers. Imports could rise thanks to import policies decided unilaterally in London, and this could lead to price collapse in certain sectors. Uh, before the immediate post-exit period, there are other serious risks. The risk that the UK government will fail to replace all of Scotland's EU funding. The risk that farmers, fish processors, growers, abattoirs and other businesses cannot get the labour that they need. But there are things that the Scottish government can do. For example, we are working tirelessly to try and minimise the impact of the new export certification that Brexit causes. However, many more things are out with our control as a devolved administration, but do have the potential to cause huge, huge damage in rural Scotland. For example, customs delays at Dover could irreparably damage the export of live seafood. For example, the UK control over the policy in regard to temporary workers, migrant labour and the permission to stay and to remain, these things all rest with London and, frankly, they're all a bit of a burach. Very serious threats to rural Scotland remain linked to both agriculture and fisheries. We have tried our best and worked extremely hard across all officials and all government directorates, uh, but given the limited cooperation from the UK Government and the uncertainty that surrounds Brexit to prepare ourselves and the sectors for what might come, I hope members will support the Scottish Government as we work to achieve the least worst outcome from this unprecedented situation. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. So we'll move on uh, to the questions, and the first question is from Maureen. Maureen Watt. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and panel. Um, Cabinet Secretary, in your opening remarks, you quite rightly um, focused on Brexit. Um, what in 
impact in practical terms does the extension to the 31st of October uh, for the UK to leave the EU have on the work of the Scottish Government in relation to both agriculture and fisheries? Well, a, in one sense, it defers the problems that uh, I alluded to in my opening statement, problems which would have arisen on the 29th of March or on the 12th of April. But on the other hand, it, it doesn't eliminate these problems. It simply defers them to a later date and a later unspecified date. It's not the 31st of October. It's some time, we think, between now and the 31st of October. And who knows? Maybe the 31st of October, like the 29th of March, is a deadline that would be extended. I mean, I, I'm just stating that, that there's a range of possibilities and the trouble that governments and government officials have in prep, making preparations for all of this is that the more uncertainty, by definition, the more difficult it is to make uh, proper preparations uh, for it. Um, as a responsible administration, we had to prepare for the risk of crashing out of a no deal. Uh, and that meant that we had made preparations convener for an emergency response style operations centre. Now, that would have been staffed by government officials. The government officials that would staff this emergency hub, as it were, would have been taken away from their day-to-day -day duties, which they would be thus unable to attend to. Arrangements were quite properly considered and ready to be put in place for that emergency-style hub. But, of course, now that the, there's been a deferral of the possibility of a no <coughs> um, that those arrangements have had to be stood down, and we can release the staff back to other duties. Um, th this is not a theoretical matter. I mean, the gentlemen around this table, all senior officials, have had a huge amount of their time that has been devoted to a no deal. And inevitably, that time is time they cannot spend in taking forward the government's agenda. Uh, with respect, I think the same scenario applies, and perhaps in, a, in spades, in a higher suit in Westminster, from all accounts. Uh, but it has had a very real um, effect. Um, the delay does prolong the uncertainty that businesses are operating under. Um, I know from, from discussions, for example, with you know, meat wholesalers that uh, they've had to make arrangements to, uh, to, to stockpile, to, uh, to acquire or procure additional chilled storage. Uh, this has all added to costs. Stockpiling for the 29th of March has now been replaced by <coughs> stockpiling from an possibly for the 31st of October or some other date, as I've already alluded to. And these, again, are not theoretical matters. These are all matters which I've heard from business have involved real costs. The same applies to supermarkets stocking up. The same applies to meat processors stocking up. All of them making the point that this is money that they've had to incur because of the no deal scenario. And this is money, capex, quite significant sums in some cases, that could have been and was intended to have been invested in other things to promote the success of their ventures. So these are just some, I don't want to, as you know, I don't like to go on, uh, convener, uh, but these are just some of the things that come to mind as uh, the problems that face us all at the moment, and problems that I hope we all recognise we do need to challenge, but it's extremely frustrating that we, we have to do so because of the, the no-deal option not being entirely removed from the table. In terms of you know six months extension or delay or whatever, I mean farmers are then going into another cycle, don't know what to to plant, what not to plant, whether to acquire more sheep or anything like that. In terms of your discussions with the sector, sectors both in agriculture and fishing, what have they said to you about the delay? Well, there are very specific concerns. Um, for, for example, regarding the impact of a no deal on the lamb sector, because one third of the Scotch lamb is exported to European markets. The UK government has estimated that uh, the uh, impact of loss of that European market or subject to a tariff of up to 40-50% would cause a, a fall, a collapse in the price of up to 45%. That's the UK's modelling. Um, and the lost revenue with a range um, very substantial figure, I think from memory about 54, 73 million, I can correct, come back with the correct figures, but um, but this is a very real risk. And I mean, I recently met <coughs> at the guest of Donald Cameron, um, MSP, some hill farmers from La Habra, and they are really worried. They're worried at the moment anyway about the future of hill farming, but add to that the possibility of losing export markets for a third or up to a third of 
produce is a very serious issue. So the UK government at our behest and the behest of the Welsh administration and Northern Irish have been modelling for a compensation scheme for, um, for sheep farmers. And in fact, I, I took the opportunity of meeting on the day this parliament was supposed to reconvene on the 11th of April. I'd fixed up a meeting with the stakeholders, which I went ahead with, uh, with the agri stakeholders. And we uh, agreed in principle that the headage scheme uh, with compensation payable directly to crofters and farmers would be, uh, well, in the situation, the least worst option. Uh, and I'm now advancing with, fish, with the help of officials, uh, uh, I, John Kerr could probably add more about this, uh, pressing the UK <coughs> government so that we use the time that we have to prepare the details of what a compensation would scheme would look like. Uh, uh, the dairy sector is, is also affected. And there's also another, just finish with this, convener, a general point that you know, because the the um, the deal on the table, such as it is, if it can be called a deal, it's really an agreement to agree in many respects. Um, that takes us just to the end of 2020. The delay to say 31st of October 19 means there's less time available after that clarity is is provided. Let's say it's 31st of October. There's less time available before the end of 2020 to sort out all the matters that haven't been agreed in the. Um, withdrawal agreement and political declaration. Um, so okay. uh, That's fine. We might come back to sheep later on. Thank you. Um, we might, <laughs> indeed. Uh, uh, next question, Peter. I think you wanted to follow up on that. Well, I mean, you have, you, Cabinet Secretary, welcome. You have, you have spoken about some of the stuff that you've done to try and, and uh, prepare the future for, these, for, the, for the various sectors. I mean, one, uh, one particular question that I have is the last time we discussed the future of support for agriculture, uh, you said that you were about to set up another new expert, expert panel to try and find the way forward. I just wonder if you could update us on how, how well that's going and when, when we're going to see who the members of that panel are and when they will likely give us some ideas to their ideas for the future support of agriculture. Well, you, you're, you're right. Uh, Parliament mandated me to do precisely that, and it was on the basis of a text which um, I think uh, Mr. Mr. Rumbles, if I recall, had a hand in uh, adjusting by discussion and, and consideration together, and I was happy to do that. We're working hard on that. It's, it's quite a, a complex and detailed task, and I don't want to put a time limit on it now. With respect, um, the fact that you say, <clears throat> an enormous amount of time convener was quite rightly devoted to a no deal, including score meetings every week, including meetings that I chaired uh, by conference call of the, the food and fish sectors and aquaculture sectors. Um, you know, something's got to give. We, we've had to rightly dev devote our, the lion's share of our attention, time and effort to, to that. So, you know, uh, other, other things would not be, pro <coughs> by definition, would not be progressed as quickly as we would like. That's just a statement of fact. But it's an important piece of work, and I commit to the committee, as I have done in the floor of Parliament, that we are working on this. Um, <coughs> we, we have to consult, I think, with some relevant organisations in order to do that. Uh, and uh, we're working hard to try and get the right people. The, the remit, of course, is to look at really a post-Brexit long-term policy. Um, and I would make the point that it's quite difficult to do that at the moment in the complete absence of certainty about what the short and medium term are going to hold. I don't know if uh, David Barnes or John Kerr has anything to add to that. Uh, well, but, but I, think I think that M Mike had a follow-up question to, to bring right, him okay. in before anyone else comes in. So. <coughs> was that question, Gavina, so I'll leave it. Oh, OK. So, um, fine. Thank you. Um, do, do, so, do, does well, the Cabinet Secretary, does somebody... Sorry? David, do you... Oh, sorry, it's Andrew Watson. Andrew, do you want to add <coughs> briefly to that? Sure. So, very briefly. So, Mr Ewing's outlined the main, the main issues. Um, I guess, from our perspective, what we've been very conscious of in terms of if you're approaching people often to give up their time to participate in this sort of event, you need to be very clear about the, the remit that they have to work to. And because of the, the kind of short-term uncertainties around um, No Deal and Brexit, it felt appropriate to just take stock of where that took us before we got into those detailed conversations with people. So as the Cabinet Secretary says, we are now um, uh, moving ahead with the, with, with the, uh, the, the project and we'll give an update to Parliament as soon as we can. OK, thank you. Uh, Yep, Peter. I mean, please. we've focused very much on, on agriculture so far. I mean, I'll ask the same question. What are you doing to prepare for the future of the fishing industry? Um, well, I, I, I did fear that... Um, that um, 
Mm. Well, I think we could briefly, Cabinet Secretary, because we are I, uh, we are going to come to fisheries in a minute. If you could briefly just put something on the fisheries, just okay, well, and, and then move. Well, I move think forward. members will will know that we we have recently published a discussion paper about future fisheries policy. That fisheries should be conducted uh, uh, on the basis of being uh, being made in Scotland, uh, of uh, uh, being on a sustainable fishery basis, of uh, so far as we can involve local governance. Uh, encourage new entrants, uh, ensure that coastal communities are th throughout Scotland and our islands and the coasts uh, uh, are able to uh, fish sustainably and benefit from new arrangements. That discussion paper, um, as a result of a, a long period of internal work by officials, including Mr Gibb, I think has been fairly well received. Um, and that does set out, I think, a very clear prospectus as to um, future fisheries policy in Scotland. The second point is that, um, that a, a no deal uh, a, for the prospect of fishery, if it were to occur on the 31st of October, I'd just like to make the point, that's really right at the heart of the thick of the period of the fisheries negotiations, the bilaterals, uh, trilaterals with uh, Norway, Iceland, Faroes. These are all being um, brought to a close or in the course of so being brought to a close at that time. So. The deferral of the date to, the, to around the 31st of October adds a new degree of complexity. Of course, the other thing is that if uh, we are out uh, in a no-deal basis, then we won't be at the table in Brussels at the fisheries negotiations in, in, uh, in uh, December. And that means we've got no voice or no say in the determination of uh, TACs uh, and quotas. So that would mean we're not at the table, the UK is not at the table. Uh, Scotland's not at the table in her own right anyway, but we wouldn't be able to play a part in the UK delegation as I've sought constructively to do, convener, for the past three months. So those are just two points. There's many other points, but you asked me to brief, so I'll just stop there, if I may. I, th I, th I think we'll move on to the next question, which is from John Finney. John. Secretary, good morning. Um, uh, Captain Secretary, the, 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 the committee did a report on crofting and the Scottish Government committed to examining the modernisation of that to make it, um, quote, more transferable, understandable and workable. I know you gave a, a briefing to the cross-party group in crofting in March 2018 where you outlined some phases and the committee was keen that anything that did come forward be such that it could be um, completed before the end of the cur current parliamentary term. On top of that, you also have, um, on the 12th of April last year, talked about non-legislative means, and that covered the issue of a, a national development plan for crofting and a new entrance scheme. When will the national uh, development plan be published, and are there plans to revive the new entrance scheme? I say that because we, we know that the uh, Young Farmers and New Entrance Startup Schemes are, are both currently closed, uh, um, and as is the, the Capital Grant Scheme. So can you give an update on that, please? Okay, well, there's quite a few things there, and uh, Mr. Finney is, is correct that uh, um, you know I, I have committed to seeking to introduce a crofting bill before the end of the session, and in sufficient time to complete that before the end of the session, that commitment uh, remains. Um, there was, as members will recall, no clear consensus on a way forward, um, but we've decided to take a two-phase approach. Phase one is focused on delivering changes that resolve known issues. Uh, which improve transparency and promote simplicity. And phase two is continuing with a more fundamental review of crafting <coughs> legislation. Sorry, just two seconds. Sorry, Sir? Peter, um, my, and, and committee members. I, I, I would just ask if you could bear in mind that I do sometimes struggle to hear uh, over conversations uh, which are going on. And, uh, and I'm, I want to hear the Cabinet Secretary's words. So if we could listen to the Cabinet Secretary, you'll all get a chance to ask your questions hopefully in the correct order uh, that we'd agreed uh, f that, that you might like to do it in, in due course. So, Cabinet Secretary, sorry, I, I would like to hear your answer. All right, I'll, I'll do my very best to make my answers even more scintillatingly interesting. <laughs> so, we're taking a two-stage approach. We've committed to legislation. It's, it's close to my heart. I mean, you know, I'm passionately com committed to doing this. I think we need to do it. I feel a moral obligation to do it. So, please don't get the get the impression, not that any opposition politicians would ever rush to different conclusions, that there's anything uh, uh, fake or insincere about this. We, we will do this. My, I will do my damnedest to do it. And I, I say that, you know, sticking my neck out a bit, because the 
the Brexit is predating upon the legislative timetable convener as well, and the time of this committee, as you know better than I. You asked also about two other things, new entrants and a national development plan for crofting. The national development plan will form a critical part of the support for crofters and crofting community. It's a, it is an important document. Um, a draft plan has been shared with members of the crofting stakeholder focus group and cross-party group in crofting and is due for further consideration at the next stakeholder forum meeting. Um, I think I did make it clear that that approach of consulting the group, consulting the stakeholders, <coughs> a big tent approach, bringing in people to the discussion to try and get a degree of consensus in an area where when we get to legislation we've found that that consensus can quite often break down. To try to do that in that way I think is important, but we are making progress with that. Uh, Mr Finney is quite right, convener, to raise the new entrance issue. Um, since 2015, the Commission has approved over 850 assignations, 140 lets and 120 divisions. Now, that's the normal bread and butter work of the Commission, but it's important to remember that that work does lead to new entrants. A significant number of those figures I've just quoted are of new, new entrants. That's a good thing. I'd also point out that the crofting grant scheme for, croft, for houses and crofts is one that, I've, again, I've taken a personal interest and tried to maximise the number of people, particularly younger people who are able to get a home in their own part of Scotland. That, too, is very close to my heart. And uh, from memory, um, and uh, my officials will correct this if wrong, but I think since 2017 we've, we've enabled about eight or 900 um, families to get crofts in their own parts of Scotland. So that's a direct way of, of, uh, of helping new entrants. Um, officials are currently working with stakeholders on a pilot new entrance scheme that will be aimed at encouraging older or less active crofters to transfer their croft to a new entrant. And I think that model is one convener that can also be applied towards farming as well of the older farmer uh, mentoring, helping, assisting, encouraging a new younger entrant to take over or become involved in some way in order to become a new entrant. So, so there's a lot going on. I'm afraid these things do, as I've said, take, take more time than we would all wish, but, but I'm confident that we are ma making s significant progress in many areas, and we tend to, uh, to build on that over the coming couple of years. Thank you. John, I'd like to bring in Raider just on crofting and then come to John Mason on a more general question. Um, just, just very quickly, the problems with the previous crofting bills have been that crofting has evolved differently in different areas, and a bill that suits one area doesn't always suit another. Mm. I think what we really need in a crofting bill is time between stage two and stage three to make sure that there are no un unintended consequences. So when you're talking about sufficient time, will there be sufficient time to do that to make sure that the bill is fit for purpose and we don't fall into the same trap as we have previously? Well, I think uh, uh, what a grant convener, if I may say so, makes an excellent point. And it's one that I've often thought over the years and 20 years I've been here, that in, many, in some cases of some bills, particularly those of complexity or you know, an arcane nature of law with which we're perhaps most of us at least are not particularly familiar, it would actually be very useful to have a slightly greater period of time between stages two and three. I think uh, Rhoda Grant has raised it, uh, this Point now, I'm pleased she's done so. What I will do is, is uh, drop a note to the Minister for Parliamentary Business just to make that point at this stage, because um, I think that would be a useful approach. Um, I, I'm not in charge of the parliamentary timetable. Uh, the, the Bureau deals with that, but, but I do think that's a good point, and I would be inclined to <coughs> rec recommend that that be given very favourable consideration, and it would do no harm to flag it up with uh, Graham Day now, so I will do that as a result of uh, Rhoda's question. And if I may say so, I think that would also help to uh, kind of embed the approach that I'm trying to take the crofting bill, that it shouldn't be a party political partisan bill, it should be, if you like, a parliament bill so far as possible. I mean, I've got here a note of the examples of phase one proposals, convener, there's uh, three, six, seven issues. I can read them out if you want. I, I, I think what I'd like okay. to do at this stage, uh, Cabinet Secretary, is, is, is bring John Mason in with, a, with, with a, a general question which may allow you to bring some of those in. John. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I mean, I take the point you've just made, Cabinet Secretary, that you're not in control of the parliamentary timetable, so anything you say or <coughs> uh, hope or commit to will be subject to that. But it was more, I mean, you've been asked just just now about the specifically about crofting legislation. I'm just wondering about other legislation 
um, what you see is happening over really over the next two years. And uh, I mean, there's been suggestions, for example, as well as crofting, Good Food Nation, perhaps bill, Ensure Fisheries, perhaps bill, uh, Future of Fisheries, Agriculture, some of the areas that there might be legislation on. I'm just wondering if you could give us an indication uh, as to what your current thinking is. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to hold you. It's not set in stone. Well, thank you for all those caveats designed <laughs> to protect me from, um, from erring. But, uh, I mean, first of all, the, the government's legislative programme hasn't been finalised, so any answers I give, I'm afraid, can't be definitive because, you know, there is quite rightly a proper process for that. But, but I have met the Minister for Parliamentary Business just a couple of weeks ago. I made a case for each of the bills in my portfolio that the government would like to take forward. For his part, uh, Mr Day made clear the government will have to fit in with the amount of parliamentary time available and the potential workload of individual committees such as this one. Um, I can answer very briefly on each, of the, I think, of the topics. Yes, I think some of my colleagues may want to ask you in more detail later right. on about, say, fisheries. <coughs> so if you, um, just really an overview at this stage? Well, I think the overview is that the, the additional factor, and I mean this is an iteration of the points I've already made, the additional factor to... to um, our workload um, from what we envisaged in, in our manifesto and in our programme for, gov program for government is Brexit. And Brexit means that we do uh, believe we will have to have uh, one or possibly two bills and we anticipate that we, will, uh, we may need a fisheries bill as well to deal with Brexit in various ways and no doubt we can come on to deal with that. But I just, I think if it's just an overview you want at this stage, can I just make the point that um, you know something has to give. If I'm to have, say, three Brexit bills, two or three Brexit bills before this committee or others, that uses up the available parliamentary time. Unless we're going to start sitting until 10 or midnight, uh, which we've done before, of course, then you know I'm not quite sure how, how we can squeeze um, a gallon into a pint pot and something's got to give, putting it absolutely bluntly. That's, that's the predicament that faces it. There's no point in skirting around it. Uh, and it is as a direct result of, of Brexit. And, you know, that's not an excuse convener. It's really just in response to Mr Mason's point, a statement of, of uh, where, where we are. Can, sorry, Cabinet Secretary, I, I think I uh, interrupted you earlier when you were about to give your wish list of bills uh, for the next two years. Um, perhaps just listing them now would be helpful. Um, the, that the committee would know what, what's, what, what they're looking forward um, to? A, well, I, 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 what was actually in my mind, a convener, before you intervened, was <coughs> to say that in relation to the good food uh, legislative uh, a, a consultation, that the consultation closed on the 18th of April, really just a few days ago. So plainly, it would be wrong to... Uh, to prejudice the outcome of the analysis of the responses to that consultation. Uh, that's not ducking any questions, it's just a statement of the obvious. We had a consultation, a wide-ranging consultation. We haven't yet had the opportunity to study the responses. That will take some time, it must be done carefully. We will do that carefully. Could that be one you hoped that, you know, if... if well, I, I hope that all bills could be accommodated, but hope is one thing, and uh, reality, I'm afraid, is, uh, is something that very often clashes with, with aspiration. But we, we will see. I mean, I, I, I'm determined to do my best to take forward all the commitments that we have and to implement uh, them as far as we, we can. Um, just running through, we've got the crofting bill. We've mentioned possibly a good food nation legislation, a rural finance bill, possibly an urgent bill for 220 um, CAP payments and possibly a fisheries bill. Um, a... Those, those are on the list that I've just been provided, and i just run, run through them briefly. No doubt we'll come back to, to each of them. And the crofting one, the, the kind of first stage of the crofting stuff would be, a, is, is definitely still a priority for you? Well, we, we do have a very solid commitment to, to, to do this on that's the crofting bill, and I, I think that's accepted across the political divide. It would be extremely unfortunate were we not able to implement that, and I will do everything I can to make sure that that doesn't arise. OK, uh, I think, Jamie, want, you want to follow up on, on one of those bills. Yes, thank you, convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, so c just for, for I do focus on the one that, that was of interest to me, you, you listed a number of, of bills there that you said used, used the phraseology we hope will be introduced in the session of Parliament. 
Are they in, in any particular order in, in the sense of, are you, is it more likely that the Brexit-related or financial-related bills will be presented to Parliament before things like crofting good food, which are more policy orientated? Um, well, the, the, the legislative programme hasn't been finalised and there are various time, um, time considerations in respect of each bill which we have to take into account. Uh, I don't think I'm in a position at the moment to state the, the, the expected order of, of bills and <coughs> we haven't done that work as, as yet. So <coughs> what, what I have committed to is that, for example, um, if legislation is required by a certain date, we will bring it forward by that date and that does require that does, I think, apply to, um, and maybe agri officials can keep me right, to the um, rural finance bill that would be required um, in order not to continue payments under um, the uh, European funding, SRDP, CAP, but to allow changes to any programmes to be made. Um, because of all the statutory instruments which you've been de dealing with, convener, over the past few months, have been put in place, that allows the mechanism to continue the payments of the existing schemes as they are. That was the purpose of them. But the distinction is that if we then, as we have indicated we wish to do in our stability and simplicity document, wish to begin to make changes and to simplify things and to streamline things and to pilot, for example, more sustainable methods of farming, just to name one example, then from, from 221 onward, I think, uh, we would want to have the uh, legal mechanism and capacity and competence to make changes. That then means, working back from that, that we have to have this rural finance bill in place by a certain time, um, and that would be in time in order to allow us to make those changes. So if you see what I mean, there's, there's time considerations for every, um, for every bill of different sorts, but there is a particular time requirement in respect of the Brexit legislation, I think. That's very helpful. Thank you. And. Uh so you're using the phrase in today's session, a rural finance bill. Um, in a previous statement to the Parliament, you used the words a rural support bill. And in other uh, statements, you've used the words, we will introduce an agricultural bill. And I just want to clarify, are those three the same or are they different? And what is the difference? Um, well, I think I've been using these words as just a shorthand. I mean, the actual bill and title, the short title and the long title, obviously haven't been finalised yet. That's part of the um, draft, drafting process. But I would, um, it, but you know, I make the, the point that the bill will cover financial support under the whole of the CAP, not only farming, but you know, things like uh, leader, things like aches, things like rural parties, and things like forestry. So in that respect, to enable us to make changes in all of these myriad of rural support schemes, I think perhaps a title like finance rural support would be a better description of what the bill is seeking to do. It wouldn't apply simply only to agriculture, although that's the lion's share of, of, of the payments, but we haven't finalised the terms of, of uh, uh, the Cabinet bill. Secretary, sorry, just, just yeah, sure. I think what uh, <coughs> Jamie's trying to get to is, is it three bills or is it two bills or is it one bill? And, well, and, and I don't think the titles are necessarily the important thing. Right. It was just the number of bills, and that would be very helpful from the committee to understand if it's how many bills it actually is. Okay. Uh, well, he did say there was three three names, so I, I'm just trying to clarify that. I hope I've done that. Um, that we anticipate financial rural support uh, would be a title that would seem to be. Um, descriptive of the purpose of the bill. But turning to the question that you've asked, we certainly, rec we certainly believe that we require this bill in order to be able to make changes to the scheme for the reasons that I've described. However, there is one pot potential technical issue which we're keeping an eye on. If the Prime Minister's, which may require another bill, convener, or it is possible, subject to advice, that this could be combined with the Rural Finance Bill, that's under consideration at the moment. The technical issue um, is that if the PM's deal were to go through in its current form, it says that EU law would continue to apply in the, in the UK until the end of 2020, except the cap direct payments regulation for 2020. So I said before that if this potential issue becomes a real one, and if it requires a short piece of technical legislation in the Scottish Parliament to deal with it, then we will bring that uh, forward. Um, and uh, as I say, if, if that is possible to be combined, in the Rural Finance Bill, then whilst I can't preempt the 
outcome of the policy development work on that matter, it, a, it is possible that that could be done, but that's very much under consideration at the moment. Now, it's a very technical matter, and I'm always uh, mindful of the fact that my officials uh, are uh, at least as well versed as me in these matters. I don't know if there's anything that David or John wants to add on that. Or uh, Cameron Secretary, really, really just to confirm everything that you've said, uh, Cabinet Secretary, the, uh, the issue in the withdrawal agreement is effectively a technicality. Unfortunately, it's quite a complicated thing. Uh, in, uh, it isn't a Scotland only issue. It would apply across the entire United Kingdom. Uh, and of course, as on many other things, we're talking with the other administrations uh, comparing notes. Uh, only this week, we've been talking with colleagues from the other administrations about the potential for consequential uh, knock-on changes for the SIs that the committee has been dealing with. Uh, and I, I, I mention that simply to give an example of the, the depth of the technical work that we need to do before officials can give advice to ministers who can then consider with Parliament how to, to take this forward. Uh, so we're, we're on the case, but it's, it's quite a complicated thing. And of course, there are still uncertainties about uh, whether the withdrawal agreement will go through, and uh, we don't yet know what the other administrations <coughs> plan to do themselves. OK, so just clarify before I go back to Jamie, is this definitely one, potentially two? Right, sorry, Jamie. Thank you for clarifying that, uh, because that, that was unclear in my mind. Jamie. Thank you, and, and that does provide some additional clarity, so thank you. But um, I, I guess what, what is perhaps unclear is I appreciate that the, the, the lion's share of the bill that the Cabinet Secretary described in whichever name it manifests itself is around uh, the Scottish Government's ability to pay farm, farmers in Scotland. And, and I wonder if that is different, however, to, for example, the content and purpose of the UK Agriculture Bill. Uh, so would we see, for example, a Scottish Agriculture Bill? And, I, and what I don't want to do is touch on the uh, WTO elements of the UK Agriculture Bill, I think, my colleague John Finney will touch on that later, but I'm looking at more of the wider picture. Are we looking at, for example, uh, rural finance and support piece of legislation which covers forestry, agriculture, etc., and an agriculture bill which will mop up some of the elements of the similarities between the UK agriculture bill? I think that's still a bit of... I'm, I'm still well, a bit unclear on that. I think, you know, that David will come in with the technical answer to that, but if I could just make a simple point that these bills that I'm contemplating... Uh, one, certainly, possibly two, that we would introduce in this Parliament to deal with uh, um, rural um, support payments and the ability to change them. Um, this is a technical matter. This is not a bill that would, uh, we believe, um, range into all sorts of policy matters. It would simply be to deal with the financial mechanism and it would be drawn to make that clear. It, it's it's a tool in the box. It's not a post-Brexit rural policy bill. It is to provide us with the ability to formulate that policy and to change support finance schemes accordingly. David. So, sorry, for the, the answer, that being said, will there be a, a, another bill which does cover policy matters relating to agriculture in Scotland? Because that's really at the crux of it. Uh, well, the, the work that, that uh, is done in respect of you know, post-Brexit policies is, is policy work. It doesn't necessarily require uh, primary legislation uh, in itself, as I understand it. And, of course, the document Stability and Simplicity, which we published last summer, which we confirmed in the debate in this Parliament in January, uh, where we confirm the principles and the approach set out in Stability and Simplicity, which, which give us five years, a, a relative period of of confidence for the farming community in particular, uh, that's the way to formulate the, the policy. Legislation is, is not necessarily the vehicle for policy formulation, but legislation is required for power in order to provide support mechanisms and to make financial payments in relation to that support. Um, I hope I've got all that right, but David will... If, it, if you, so. when, when you come in, if you could stick uh, not to UK legislation but to <coughs> Scottish legislation. Yes, indeed. <coughs> uh, I'll really, to confirm what the Cabinet Secretary said, the, uh, the bill that my team is working on now will be to create the tool to deliver the policy approach 
that was set for five years, which was set out in the stability and simplicity consultation paper. The policy for beyond that period, uh, as was discussed previously, is work which has yet to be done. So, as the Cabinet Secretary said, the analysis on whether what that does or doesn't require in legislative terms, by definition, can't be done until the policy work has, has been done. So, the focus of the bill that we're preparing now is, uh, is entirely on delivering stability and simplicity, which, uh, on which there was the consultation last year, and the Cabinet Secretary confirmed in, uh, in the debate in January that, uh, that the government was going to press ahead with that approach in light of the, the positive responses. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that leads us on to the next uh, bit, which is Peter Chapman. Peter. Thanks, Convener. Well, back, back to fisheries, Cabinet Secretary. Your, your recent Future of Fisheries Management in Scotland discussion paper indicated that the inshore fisheries bill that, that had been proposed previously will now be included in wider fisheries legislation. What else will be included in wider fisheries legislation? Um, well, as, as Mr Chapman knows, the UK Fisheries Bill is currently before the Westminster Parliament, uh, and we think it, it would be premature to bring forward fisheries legislation before the Scottish Parliament because uh, we don't know what um, additional powers the UK Fisheries Bill is proposing to confer upon Scotland. We understand um, from ministerial statements that it is being envisaged that further powers will be passed to Scotland by virtue of for fishing in respect of the, um, the fisheries bill. But of course, it hasn't completed its passage through Westminster. So as a matter of process, it would be premature and impossible to legislate uh, in Scotland on these matters until we know what powers are going to be passed, if any, to Scotland by the UK fisheries bill. Um, once the UK Fisheries Bill has received assent, um, then we will, of course, convener, consider all the powers available to us and any remaining gaps in these powers and reflect on our direction of travel following the discussion around the um, discussion paper, the future of fisheries management, and at that point decide whether additional legislation would be required. So basically what we're saying is until there's more, more clarity as far as the Brexit situation is concerned, nothing, nothing will change as far as inshore fisheries in Scotland is concerned. Is that basically is that a, a true reflection of what you just uh, said? Well, I was about to, say, about to say agreed, but not you just added a twist at the end. Um, certainly, I mean, as far as powers go, I'm not trying to be... As far as powers go, I mean, we can't legislate here unless or until we know what the powers we have are going to be, and we don't. That's just, again, a statement of fact. I'm not really making any political point at this stage. Um, we need certainty to be able to legislate, because legislation is really about conferring certainty uh, by means of the legislative provisions included in any bill. So uh, we don't have certainty we can't legislate. That doesn't mean that we can't advance the cause, though, of inshore fisheries. We're doing that, Mr Gibb and his colleagues are doing that you know, day in, day out, working with fisheries communities around Scotland, working hard to identify how we can help them. So the help, the assistance uh, of fisheries, a devolved area, is going on on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, that's very important just to make that distinction convener. Legislation is one thing, but, you know, most of the work that Mr Gibb and his colleagues do is, is really to implement legislation to advance the cause of sustainable fisheries, to support communities, to try out pilot schemes of different types of fisheries, as we've been doing quite successfully uh, uh, recently in respect of electrofishing, in respect of trials in the Western Isles and so on and so forth, uh, and to, you know, help in other areas like uh, grant finance for uh, smaller vessels in uh, Scallop, the scallop sector to equip them with remote electronic monitoring equipment, for example, which would again lead to sustainable fisheries and deal with other problems which have been identified and are quite controversial. So all of these things, it's just important uh, for me to make the point that the work goes on in what is already uh, a devolved area. Okay. The questions on fisheries which I'd like to bring in now. Stuart, I think you've got some, and then I'm going to come to John Finney with his questions. So, Stuart. Uh, uh, thank you. Extending beyond simply the info fisheries and looking at the UK fisheries bill more generally, um, the Scottish Government made proposals on quota and effort and seafood levies and a number of other matters. Have we had uh, a definitive response as to what the UK uh, Government intends to do with these proposals? Uh, well, the answer is, is no. Um, 
I mean, in respect of post post Brexit, um, you know, to be fair, I, I I wouldn't expect there to be copper plate answers on all of these things just at the moment. You know, I would stress that up till now, um, particularly George Eustace, myself, before he resigned, we had good. Uh, don't think his resignation has anything to do with me, incidentally, but I think we had quite good working relations. We tried to work together. Uh, a, but no, I don't think it's it's the case that the future policy in these matters has been settled. I think it is the case, or maybe Mr. Gibb could give some more um, factual technical information, that there are differences of approaches that, that we believe should be taken and are at the moment taken in respect of some of these matters in addressing maximum sustainable yield, choke species, uh, a, and the approach towards quota. I don't know if Mr. Gibb could uh, interject at this point. Um, <coughs> yes, I can uh, very briefly, as the um, Cabinet Secretary states, we have um, slightly different um, management um, aspirations uh, in Scotland as to other parts of the, of the United Kingdom. Um, in terms of how we manage our, our quotas, how we manage uh, the landing obligation, the commitments to maximum sustainable yield, the Scottish Government's always been very supportive of that. Um, the target for 2020 is extremely challenging. Um, we prefer to have a focus on the international obligation, whereby it's to manage towards maximum sustainable yield, um, being one um, slight difference. And um, our fisheries are very different north of the border to south of the border, and therefore the management is likely to require different approaches um, in that sense. Okay, thank you, thank you for that, uh, Alan. Uh, the next question is from John Finney. John. Okay, uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to ask about the UK Agricultural Bill and uh, particularly the World Trade Organisation clause and our understanding that the Welsh Government has laid a, a legislative consent motion for changes to the Agricultural Bill in the House of Commons and that includes a minimum of understanding between the UK Government and the Welsh Government on the WTO provisions and importantly how they'll operate. Can I ask, has the Scottish Government made any arrangements with the UK Government about the WTO provisions in the UK Agricultural Law? Uh, well, yes, we have sought to, and we have worked constructively with the Government, and at official level that, that work uh, continues. There has been a disagreement in the Ag Bill about uh, the whether or not uh, some legislative provisions are devolved or reserved. And um, these... a the, the World Trade Organization and the implementation of w, WTO um, rules and laws, uh, the implementation of that is an area which we believe to be devolved. The UK government takes a different view, uh, says that uh, that is a reserved, entirely reserved function. We have had, I think, to convener to agree to disagree uh, uh, on that. Um, we uh, have, have uh, however, continued to work constructively with them and the Welsh and Northern Irish colleagues. That's included developing mechanisms to ensure that the UK continues to comply with its WT obligations for notifying and reporting and for engagement in WTO committees um, and exploring a fair and equitable allocation of the UK's amber box um, uh, support limit which is a constraint on the extent to which payments can be made in, in certain ways for agriculture. Um, and we, we I would emphasise that we are seeking to work constructively together. We, the last point I make, conveners, on this point, we, we, we have been clear that the disagreement on this clause could be resolved by the UK government agreeing that the regulations to be made under it do require the consent of Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish ministers. That would respect the evolution and underpin the constructive joint working we want to see, <clears throat> and we don't quite understand why the UK is unwilling to accede to this uh, request. And similarly, the, on the other clauses where there's disagreement, that's um, about the nature of uh, powers reserved or devolved, and that's producer organisations and fairness in the supply chain. We have presented amendments to DEFRA. You know, we haven't just said, uh, we don't agree with you, Yabu. You know, we actually have presented amendments putting uh, forward uh, uh, views that would address our concerns. And whilst these have been rejected in the UK committee, we hope they will be looked on more favourably as the bill progresses. Thank you. Just for the avoidance of any doubt, then, is there, there's no formal mechanism whereby if there's a disagreement between the devolved administrations and the UK government that, I don't know, there's some arbitrary would apply. And, and, and following on from that, is it the Scottish Government's intention to lay another legislative consent motion in relation to the bill? Um, well, the Joint Ministerial Committee, I believe, is the 
is, is, is the body which would consider any um, formal request of, of differences. Um, I'm not sure it's likely. I mean, I don't want to uh, be unfair to the GMC. I'm not sure, given its constitution, whether it's likely to reach any other uh, opinion. I mean, it's a kind of example of, kind of marking your own homework, in a sense, rather than being an independent, uh, non-political body. But be all that as the may, it's GMC is the answer to your first question on, on the... Um, uh, on, on, uh, just remind me of your second question again. Is the Scottish Government likely to lay another legislative consent motion in respect of uh, this bill? Well, we, we think that um, there, there may be uh, a, a, a requirement to, to do so. Um, the new clause in the red meat levy relates to devolved issues, and this does require the consent of the Scottish Parliament. This is not actually a Brexit-related issue. Um, a, uh, there are some other matters that DEFRA are considering which might require consent. Um, so the answer is yes, we, we may need to bring forward a legislative consent memorandum. Progress has been made in respect of the red meat levy and the repatriation of money that uh, is attributable to Scottish animals in relation to those animals which are slaughtered in uh, down south. Am I anticipating another question? I don't know. As, as you Shall often do, there? Cabinet Secretary. Sorry about oh. that. <laughs> I've just tried to be helpful. You know? yeah. that, that's kind. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. And John, oh. on the red meat levy, um, <laughs> The, uh, are you, I mean, simply, I mean, are you comfortable now with what the UK is proposing? Um, I, I'm not quite sure that I'm ready to sit comfortably in my armchair. Um, I'm optimistic that we may have reached a, a positive outcome. But uh, just preparing for this debate, actually, it just occurred to me that I'd prefer to see it in writing and be absolutely clear um, uh, that QMS is satisfied that we know exactly what the agreement is going to be. We've got a fair understanding of the additional revenue that will come to QMS to market Scotch beef and lamb and pork. Um, and uh, I'm not absolutely certain that that's the case, but I, I think there's grounds for optimism. And we'll come back to the committee on that, if I may, uh, Mr. Mason. Uh, but I just wanted to make absolutely clear before I, I indulge in exuberant overconfidence OK, no, we're not expecting you to be exuberant or overconfident. Um, the, you, you mentioned, I mean, the extra money. Would, would that extra money, if it comes back, go to Quality Meat Scotland, specifically for, you know, work in this area? This, this is their job. Quality Meat Scotland exists to promote quality meat produced in Scotland. So we would anticipate that, that um, as far as I know, I think that's, that's where the funding goes and the funding would be deployed for, for further marketing. And the marketing has been tremendously successful. Uh, and I think uh, I would like to see a lot more of it, particularly actually, I mean, if there is a threat to Scotch lamb exports, for example, you know, perhaps there should be a big effort in the UK to promote uh, Scotch lamb and lamb from, from other parts in the UK to encourage a take up and consumption by UK consumers. That's, um, you know, an idea that we've put in discussions with Mr. Gove and I think has, has broad support and principle. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Richard Lowe. Richard. Yes, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, on the 28th of March 2019, your department wrote to the Convener of Public Audit and Post Legislative Scrutiny Committee with an update on the delivery of rural payments. In line with that letter, will 95% of basic payments be made by the end of June 2019? And also, are you content that all issues with the CART IT system are now resolved? <laughs> Uh, well, the first, the first uh, question, I'm, I'm confident that we're on track to meet our obligations by the legal uh, date of the, towards the end of June. Um, I have a weekly conference call with uh, senior um, CAP officials, uh, a, including very often Mr. Watson. Uh, and in that call this morning, I was advised that in respect of the 218 Pillar 1 payments, um, a 52% or just over 9,000 have been paid this year, and a further 3,800 are in the pipeline to be paid, I believe, uh, relatively quickly. Um, that means, convener, we are ahead of where we were last year, so that is progress. And let's not forget, of course, that uh, the vast majority of the recipients of these payments um, will have received loan payments, in most cases, in October last year, two months ahead of the rest of the UK. In respect of is our CAP IT system perfect, um, 
well, we've made very solid progress. Um, we've implemented uh, a, a software and a computer uh, apparatus, of which uh, I'm no expert, which allows us to operate the system more uh, effectively, including principally the LIPIS system, which is the Land Parcel Information Service, uh, wh where we've had the services of a, 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 of a company based in Slovenia, actually, uh, uh, who have been extremely responsive and helpful in working together on these matters. And that LIPIS, what does it mean? It allows us to match the information obtained at the inspections by the ARPID inspectors who go out with a backpack and a big piece of kit and check the boundaries at various points of uh, each boundary uh, of every land holding uh, and then apply that data. And there's over 1,000 million pieces of data to apply that data to uh, the mapping, the digital mapping of every land holding in Scotland in order then to be able to operate effectively the application of the rules for the individual payment schemes um, to that holding. Um, so I, I'm very confident that a lot of progress has been made thanks to the good work of uh, Scottish Government uh, officials. Uh, a, and if, if any more information is sought, then Andrew Watson can supply absolutely all of it. Can't you, Andrew? So. Right. Sorry, before Richard. Sorry, just before you m move on to you, because I know you've got another question. Can I just clarify something? Uh, you uh, kindly shared in confidence a report uh, with the committee on the CAP IT system. <clears throat> I think it was some two years ago. Would it be possible uh, to update the committee on the recommendations in that report and where they've been met, so we're kept fully appraised of the situation? Because that seems to be the baseline data that the committee has. Well, I'm very happy to look at that and perhaps write to the committee, because I, I can't recollect all the recommendations for that report two years ago, but, you know, it's an important piece of work. So if it's an order convener, um, unless Mr Watson's got anything else to add now, then we'll go back, look at that report and, and revert to the committee in writing. Uh, that would be very helpful, and, and, and certainly there were a huge amount of recommendations. I happened to reread it the other day, um, so I, I, I wouldn't expect you to have the answers to all of them. But sorry, it would be very helpful, I think, for the committee to have that. R Richard, sorry, you had another question. Yeah, I, I'm actually reminded uh, that I went to your office in Hamilton and, and saw all the equipment that the staff are, are using. And can I say I'm, I'm very uh, complimentary to the staff that are doing this work. Anyway, can we move on to another subject, uh, which is uh, quite uh, um, people would like to know. Are the loans for basic payments here to stay if the UK stays in the EU or, in fact, leaves the EU? Um, well, the, the, the loan payments for, for the basic payment, uh, a Pillar 1 scheme and for Elfas, have, I think... Um, provided uh, crofters and farmers with an element of uh, stability and certainty, not least because the loan payments have mostly been made at the level of 90% of entitlement, and also that in all but a very limited range of circumstances, there's no interest on the payments. So although they have to be called loan payments, uh, they are in fact uh, de facto more advanced payments than anything else unless there is an overpayment and a clawback, and the clawback is not paid within, I think, 21, 28 days. So, um, first of all, I think the loan payments have provided stability to farmers and crofters in particular, and the whole supply chain, who rely on that money um, going into the rural economy around three, four hundred million a year. Um, secondly, will they be here to stay? Well, um, I, I think they have served a very useful purpose. As long as they are required, uh, I would certainly be advocating to Mr Mackay that they, because they perform such a useful purpose and because they've gained, I think, a degree of currency and acceptability and familiarity, then they are a useful tool in the box. Um, as to future decisions regarding budgetary finance, these haven't been made. These would need to be discussed very carefully with Mr Mackay. Um, but the other factor is uh, that uh, you know the loan payments were brought in because we weren't certain about when we would be able to make the the full payment and what date by what date we would be able to do that, uh, and therefore 
uh, unless or until I have near 100% certainty as to when these payments um, can be made, then I would be loath to, to move away from the, the loan payments, provided, of course, there is the financial transactions budget to support them. So um, I don't think it's correct to say that they're, they're here to stay, but I think that, that uh, they, they, they are extremely useful, and as long as they're required, I will continue as the, as the farming minister to advocate that they should be used uh, to help farmers and communities and rural Scotland. Uh, thank you. M Mike, you want to come in briefly on yes, that? Can I just up on, on that point? I mean, <clears throat> as far as I understand it, the loans were there because, because of the failure of the computer system. We couldn't actually guarantee the payments to those entitled to receive them. Um, <clears throat> my question really is, I mean, I I've just heard what, what you've said, and I understand that you want to keep it as, a, as an option, but surely the intention must be to return to direct payments. Is, is, is that your intention, to, that as soon as this is available, that as soon as you're, you are um, certain, as you can be, that the system is restored, that you return to normal? Well, uh, that would be the optimal <coughs> solution. I mean, the optimal solution is that every payment is made as swiftly as it possibly can be, and, uh, and that's the optimal solution. I'm not persuaded that we're quite there yet, although we have made enormous progress. I mean, I mean quite candid with you, uh, there's no point in anything else. Um, and as long as I think we need the loan payments, I would continue to advocate that they should be deployed, although that's a discussion to be had with the Finance Secretary, who has been extremely helpful and appreciative and understanding of the needs of, uh, of uh, rural Scotland. Um, I mean, I, I would respectfully point out, Convener, that we're not the only administration in the UK to have had uh, issues. Um, those uh, readers of Private Eye will be able to follow the progress or lack of it if with regard to environmental payments by DEFRA. Um, they seem to be more interested than DEFRA than the difficulties that we have, maybe because we're overcoming them. But be that as it may, um, you know, uh, a, my, my, my day job is this, this remains the top priority for me to get a handle on it. I think we have got a handle on it, but at the same time it would be, it would be imprudent of me were I less than, say, 99% certain to move away from, from a, a useful tool, which I think has served rural Scotland quite well. And, you know, I do make the point that the Scottish farmers and crofters receive 90% of their entitlement, in most cases in October, two months earlier than the rest of the UK. So they actually got the money earlier than the rest of the UK. If we think ahead to a no deal on the 31st of October, you know, there becomes a compelling narrative and reason and motive to make sure that if there's the, to be the uncertainty of a no deal possibility in October, that we do everything we can to mitigate that. So again, that's, I mean, quite candid, that's a factor that's, uh, uh, that's in my mind at the moment about this. And obviously, as soon as we, um, uh, as soon as we, we, we can clarify the Brexit situation, then that in turn allows us to, uh, to uh, approach the decision about whether or not to seek other loan provisions from Mr. Mackay, an easier one to make. So, Cabinet Secretary, just so I clarify again in my mind, is, is, is your intention to move back to the system as it was in the past, where the majority of payments have been paid 100% by Christmas? That's the way it was. Um, is that your aim? Well, that would be the optimal outcome, yes. Thank you. Um, and the next question, therefore, is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary panel. Um, you stated as far back as uh, January or February that you wanted to try and maintain LFAS payments at 100%, um, even though they were due to go down in 2019 and 2020 to 80 and 48% uh, respectively. Can you give us a progress update on where we are with that, please? Um, well, yes, the, the LFAS is, I, I think, an, an essential form of financial support for um, farmers and crofters, not least in Gail Ross's part of Scotland that she uh, represents. Uh, and I'm acutely aware of just how important that support is for those farmers and the economic modelling and analysis of the relative importance of that financial support to these group of farmers indicates that it's extremely important to them. And that factor and the importance of indeed sustaining rural communities as well 
that are in, enriched by the farmers and crofters in their midst, active farmers and crofters. These are all factors that uh, I, I weigh very heavily indeed. The rules of the LFAS scheme itself are that um, this year we're able to make payment at the full amount, and indeed I think it's correct to say that this year's payments have, uh, uh, have, uh, uh, have uh, exceeded previous years. However, next year, the, the, under the LFAS rules, the maximum payment will be 80% uh, of total, and the following year, 40%. Uh, and it's uh, my aim in, uh, to try to, uh, in broad terms, in real terms, maintain uh, broadly the level of support at the existing levels insofar as it's possible to do so. Um, this is challenging. Uh, because one must operate within the, the um, SRDP, CAP, and, and indeed finance manual rules. Um, and officials are currently convener working on what we call workarounds to see what the options are so that we achieve the objective of broadly speaking, not exactly or precisely, but broadly speaking, keeping the levels of income around about where they are for those who many people would adjudge need it most. Um, it, it's a complex matter. Um, I think it's Mr Kerr that can perhaps add a bit more if, if the committee wishes in detail, but that's an overview of uh, what I want to do and where we are at the moment. Oh, sorry, John, do you have anything to add? Well, um, just to uh, maybe expand a little bit on what the Cabinet Secretary has already said, we are working very hard on this issue. It, it has... Um, a lot of our attention and we've also been in informal discussion with stakeholders about um, the potential solutions that we have and we've broadly received quite supportive comments from um, um, a wide range of um, stakeholders, NFUS, um, the National Beef Association, Af National Sheep Association have all spoken to us and others. Um, so we're working hard to resolve this issue. We recognise that the constraints are there, but we are absolutely committed to making um, the to supporting those businesses who need it most in our um, hill and upland areas. And if we were to um, if we were to take that level up to broadly speaking what it is at the moment, um, so an extra twenty percent and then the extra sixty percent, do you have any idea how much that would cost? Uh, so we've got a clear sense of what the um, the the money would be if we were to pay it at the full rate. So it's about thirteen million in um, for the first year. Uh, the the thing that we need to bear in mind, though, is that the, the cohort of people that we're talking about are actually in receipt of, um, many of them are in receipt of uh, additional basic payments because of the way that our internal convergence has operated. So we need to bear in mind that the total picture is a bit more complicated than just the LFAS replacement or, um, uh, or an additional um, compensation arrangement to make sure that those people are um, adequately um, safeguarded financially from the constraint in terms of the constraint that they face when they're farming. So it's a complicated picture and we're trying to work through those issues uh, as best we can. Um, Cabinet Secretary quite rightly stated how important um, LFAS payments are to a lot of our crofters and farmers. If we don't manage to mitigate those impacts, what are we going to do instead? I mean, at the moment we're working hard to to uh, find a workaround in order to manage these impacts, and, and that's an extremely important piece of work uh, for me. And we've discussed it with stakeholders, as uh, John Kerr has said, and we'll continue those discussions. And that work continues. Um, you know, there is another element to this, and that is the BU review on CAP convergence, which is currently underway. And any additional funding arising from that review would be prioritised for LFA. Um, uh, and given that Scotland's payment rate per hectare is only 45% of the EU average, that um, full convergence uplift would be a step in the right direction. It would still leave us short of the 196 hectare um, a Euro EU threshold, um, but uh, I, I'm due to meet with Lord Bew and present our arguments in respect of the convergence issue. Uh, 
and it would, to me, be un uh, unthinkable that this review would not result in additional money to come into Scotland. We are due that money. That money was for Scotland. It came to the UK only because of Scottish farmers. The rest of the farmers in the UK, with all respect to them, had payments per hectare in excess of the trigger of 90% of the UK of the EU average. And actually, in 2019, this year, Scotland is at the very bottom of the league table of payments per hectare of any farmers in the EU. That is the reality and a matter of fact. So for these reasons, Convener, you know, I do hope that Michael Gove, who, to be fair, has expressed his desire to support hill farmers in Scotland, and broadly that's a proxy for Elfast, uh, 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 you know, and I have a, a reasonable working relationship with him, I do hope that the fine phrase, the fine sentiments, uh, will be matched by deeds in the uh, upshot of the Bureau review, and we would expect the Bureau review to conclude um, reasonably soon in the next month or so. I think would that be right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I just thought I sh should add that because it is another piece in the jigsaw, and it's very important <coughs> uh, to put the pressure where I think deservedly it should be. Uh, it should be pressed, namely in the UK government, to make good the the uh, loss of convergence money. Cabinet Secretary, there's a few follow-up questions on that. Uh, Peter first, followed by Rhoda. Thanks, uh, Convener. I, I mean, I, I have been particularly worried by the answers we've just had in Elfast. It, it would appear that there's a real danger that the levels will be cut. I have heard nothing from, from you, you, Cabinet Secretary, or, or your, uh, your uh, support members here that anything has been achieved. You, you spoke about a workaround months ago, and you've used that same phrase today, that you, you're trying desperately for a workaround, but I, I hear nothing that gives me or, or our health farmers across Scotland any comfort that you're achieving anything towards doing that. Um, so, you know, the, I, uh, I, I would be very worried, as, uh, as most of the farming community will be, that you're really not achieving much. And I mean, I, I, I just throw that out. out. I, I, are, you, are you in any way confident that you can achieve the workaround that you speak about? Uh, well, first of all, let's just rewind and go over some of the facts, shall we? Uh, this year's payment has been made at 100%. Uh, you remember last year that the EU plan was that the payment for this year should be reduced to 80%. Uh, that decision was countermanded because of intervention, quite rightly, by the, EU, by the EU Parliament. Um, and that then led to reinstatement towards the end of the financial year of being able to pay LFAS at 100%. Now, I bust a gut to make sure that we could move from the 80% we budgeted to 100%. So, first of all, the facts are that I've already illustrated and already acted to make sure that LFAS was maintained at the full level. I've already done that. That's just a matter of fact. And it's not easy to make in-year changes to budgets, I can tell you. Budgets are planned on an annual basis. They're not mucked about every month just because somebody wishes to. It's more complicated than that. It's orderly. So I made absolutely sure that we went to 100% as soon as we were able to do that, as well as pressing for that outcome. So I'm absolutely determined to find a, a workaround, but these things are not, are, are not straightforward. Um, and the, the second point I would make, Convener, is this, that we don't know what the rules will be for 2020 because they depend on an outcome of Brexit. So we're trying to make a workaround within the rules without knowing exactly what those rules are going to be. So I'm afraid that doesn't make our task any easier. And lastly, you know, if the Scottish Conservatives wish to fully sign up to our, our campaign to get the money due to Scotland, back to Scotland, to Scottish farmers, I would be a very happy man. No, I mean, as, as, as far as convergence money is concerned, you, you have our support. We have always given you support on that. But this is a different, this is a different issue. Convergence is one issue. This is another issue, and it, it, it appears to me that you have you have no real uh, confidence that you will be able to, to make up the difference going forward. And I mean, is it correct? And I believe it is correct that the reduced Elfast payments required by the EU will actually save the Scottish government money because the EU the EU share will st will still come in at the same level, and it will save it will save the, the, the Scottish government money the, the reduced payment in Elfast. No, that's not correct. And uh, you know, I'm determined to, to do this. I don't think we should be bleakly pessimistic uh, about this in our approach. There is a challenge. We're working very hard on this. I've stated where we want to get to, and we uh, 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 will continue to inform uh, the REC uh, of progress 
that we make. But with respect, the convergence and LFAS are unbelikely connected here. The two are interlinked. Convergence is to restore the imbalance because Scottish farmers and crofters get the lowest amount per hectare of any farmers in Europe. Uh, if the money that was due uh, to Scotland, the uh, 160 million balance, if, um, was uh, paid as it should be, and I'm pleased that Mr Chapman agrees that it should, then this problem disappears. Uh, uh, and if the lesser option of the Bureau review money for the period 220 to 222 results as it should do in a substantial payment to Scotland, that allows us substantially to uh, uh, have the funding in order to uh, tackle the the uh, challenge that we face. So the two issues with respect are, I think, very much interlinked. Uh, but uh, we, we will continue our efforts and we will report to REC, of course, as soon as we appropriately can. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, just before I go to Red Grant, can I just ask you a question? The, the convergence uplift that you've just mentioned, I think, of 160 million, the back payment, if that was made, would that go directly to the farmers who it was due to for the years they've missed out on it? Well, I, I, I mean, this is partly a technical matter, but uh, you know, I, I have uh, made it clear that that money should go to, to the rural community, and I think it would fall within the ambit of the SRDP overall. Uh, but it's partly a technical... So politically, the answer is yes, I'm determined. After all, it's for them. I mean, it's, it's, it's not for the health service or education directly. It's for farming community. I don't know if... It's, it's in part a technical question as well as a question of political will, so I don't know if Mr. Kerr wants to add anything to that. And so, so it, it, from a technical point of view, in order to make the payment in a legal way, a little bit depends on how the back pay would come to us. So if the Treasury were to write the wrong of the past and simply give the transfer of the monies to us, then we could spend it where, it, as Cabinet Secretary has said, where we think it's needed most. And, uh, and I think we've, we've made plain uh, what, what that would be. If it comes to us in the form of um, something that has to be paid out through the cap ceilings, then we'd be a little bit more constrained about how we pay the money out. And it's uh, those issues that we're currently still working through. OK. Right. So you had a question on that. Yes. Just um, if I can clarify first. Um, basic, if basic payments go up, then someone's LFAS goes down. Is that, am I right in understanding that from what you said? No, the, the, no the two are not linked in that way. Okay, I, I maybe picked that up wrong because that was what I thought you'd said. Can I, can I ask about um, whether or not you've considered looking at a scheme um, of natural constraint payments, which I think would fit in with the EU's um, needs for a scheme rather than an LFAS payment, and why have you not moved in that direction? What's the implications of that? Well, we, we did look very carefully at the NC scheme, which, as uh, Rhoda Grant says, is, is uh, an EU-approved alternative. Uh, however, there wasn't a clear consensus as to any particular brand or option of mechanism under ANC, and it was clear that some current recipients of LFAS would lose out under ANC, and some others who are not in LFAS, and arguably rightly so, would qualify under ANC, possibly. So th these were considerations which led us to conclude that the benefits of LFAS are certainty and clarity, and that moving to ANC would uh, not enjoy majority or consensus support and would involve substantial changes with many losers uh, and some gainers, uh, uh, and we didn't consider that that would work for the Scottish context. Um, I'll move on to the next question, which, which is from me, and it's on a wider agricultural issue. Um, Cabinet Secretary, do you agree with Lord Gill uh, when he said that the 2016 Land Reform Act was stifling the creation of new tenancies, agricultural tenancies? Um, well, I obviously take very seriously Lord Gill's view, and indeed I, I read um, what he, what it, uh, the reports of what he had to say. Um, I think it's safe to say that, um, that there has been progress made in respect of relations between landlord and tenant. Um, and I don't have the right bits of paper right in front of me now, but just some headline points I, I would like to make. There was an analysis of relationships between landlords and tenants, and that showed actually there was a very high satisfaction rate of landlords, slightly less with tenants, about 80 or 90 percent, that kind of order. 
Um, and what I took from that is that most landlord-tenant relationships are operating reasonably well. Now, of course, some aren't, a minority aren't, and that's serious. But actually, uh, the picture is less bleak than sometimes it is painted. Secondly, um, the uh, Part 10 changes in the 16 bill have led to, I think, around about um, 70 or 80 new modern uh, limited duration tenancies being taken out. And the third general point I would make is that in the response to Lord Gill's comments, which I think have caused a, provoked a useful debate, um, I think Chris Nicholson from the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association made the comment that he felt that the changes that have been brought in by us, the, the WAGO compensation measures, the um, modern duration, limited duration tenancies, the uh, commitment on rent review provisions and on assignation are all welcome. And in addition to that, the creation of the Tenant Farming Commissioner, Bob McIntosh, has been very well received. So in other words, uh, there are different views on this, and I respect all. I'm keen to, to understand everyone's views here, landlords, tenants, and others. But you know, the body representing the tenant farmers in Scotland felt that there wasn't a case, as Lord Gill, I think, stated, for a widespread review of landlord tenancy legal framework at this point, because we're just bedding down the changes and working on bringing in the remainder of the changes, assignation and rent, rent review, which Parliament mandated us to from uh, 2016. Okay. Uh, first of all, Cabinet Secretary, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the, the satisfaction between landlord and tenant, certainly from the information that, that I've seen. In the majority of cases, in the vast majority of cases, it, it, it's a good relationship. But the fact of the matter is, is we are seeing less land being made available for agricultural tenancies, and it remains one of my, and I'm sure everyone else on this committee's, strong uh, wish without speaking for them, to see more agricultural tenancies created, more opportunities for new entrants. And we're not seeing that. Do you not think it's time now to grasp the nettle and, and take some action to make sure that new tenancies are created? Well, as I said, we, we have. Um, the nettle has been well and truly grasped. And the figure I was looking for was the modern limited duration tenancies came into force on the 30th November 2017 at least 69 of these tenancy types, tenancy types were already in operation in 2018. Um, uh, and, you know, I've alluded to the favourable comments from the Christopher Nicholson. Um, there's more work to be done. I agree with that. Um, I, we, we have indicated uh, in response to the committee before that uh, the government has no plans to introduce an absolute right to buy for tenant farmers. Um, we would like to see more take up of, of uh, the available vehicles for tenancy. And also, uh, uh, as you'll be well aware, convener, there is scope for contract farming arrangements and flexible arrangements, which some farmers find uh, a useful business model to pursue. But, but I do think there's uh, perhaps a feeling across the parties that we, we want to do more with respect to new entrants. We have done a lot in this session of Parliament. We've been the only par part of the UK to devote considerable funding to new entrants. Um, uh, and uh, we would like to do more to, uh, to bring in new blood. But then again, there's an awful lot of positives happening. I, I had the pleasure of meeting a group of young um, farmers uh, uh, on a scholarship visit to California and uh, you know they're a credit to Scotland uh, uh, as are young farmers and crofters throughout the land so you know so I'll resist the the offer to be overly gloomy a uh, convener okay um I, I don't think uh, I'm gloomy about the, about the potential that's out there it's just realizing the potential by making more land available which I haven't seen, and perhaps we'll leave it at there and allow Maureen to come back in with her question um, in relation to a different subject. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, in your answer to my uh, opening question, uh, we briefly touched on uh, the sheep sector and the impact of Brexit uh, on the sheep sector. I mean, there have been some um, alarming headlines in terms of there needing to be emanating from, from Westminster and needing to be um, mass slaughter of sheep. Can you maybe in a bit more detail sh spell out what the implications of Brexit are for the sheep 
sector and you know what is the worst case scenario for the sector and how are we in Scotland going to be able to um, help our sheep farmers? Okay. Um, well, a third of UK lamb production is exported and the lion's share goes to the continent. Um, it's really the event of a no-deal Brexit uh, that we are principally concerned about in this respect. Um, exports to Europe would face tariffs of 40% or more, making it simply uncompetitive. And I think it's relevant to point out that at the same time as Scotch lamb, UK lamb, facing tariffs of 40%, over 100,000 tonnes of New Zealand lamb would be able to be exported to Europe tariff-free. So it, this is, a, a, you know, colloquially a double whammy, and it leads directly to very serious concerns that there would be a collapse if, in the event, if there's a no deal in the uh, export market and they simply could not absorb, the UK market or other sources couldn't readily absorb that extra volume of lamb which currently goes to European markets. Now, I mean, nobody wants this to happen. Everybody wants to avoid this. The best outcome is to avoid this happening. Um, purchasers, clients, customers in Europe want to continue to buy Scotch lamb. They want to buy it because it's high quality, because people enjoy it. And therefore, there's a commercial impetus to continue this. So let's not be, be too pessimistic about this. But we have to plan for a compensation scheme. So I've been pressing, along with Leslie Griffiths in Wales, in particular in the Northern Irish Administration, Michael Gove and his colleagues, for some considerable time, along with the NFU-S and the NFU South of the Border and the um, uh, National Sheep Association for <coughs> a compensation scheme. And to be fair, the DEFRA have accepted that there is a case. They've done certain modelling. The modelling shows the need for a compensation scheme. Um, a John Kerr can perhaps come in the moment and remind me of the precise uh, estimated uh, quantum of the expected uh, a compensation required, but it would be of a very tall, a very substantial amount. Now, um, the, there was a debate about how such a scheme should operate. Should it operate for a cull system? Should it operate for a headage payment? And there's various other variants. I think the consensus has emerged that although we'd all prefer to avoid this, if that has to be the case, then a headage scheme is, is the one that I think most of the stakeholders, at least in the meeting I had on the 11th of April, agreed would be the least worst. So um, so that's one point. The other point is, well, would, who would pay for this compensation? Um, uh, and frankly, you know, we, th th this is direct result of a no deal. We don't have a budget, a compensation budget, we don't have money hanging around waiting to be used for this because we've no budgetary provision for it. So the UK Treasury would be responsible for it. Uh, and uh, I've pressed um, repeatedly Mr Gove to confirm that the UK will meet these responsibilities. Uh, and what I can say is this, that uh, in the meeting that took place in January of this year, uh, Mr Gove made a commitment that Brexit costs would be met by the UK government. And that commitment was minuted, and those minutes were not challenged. So in the face of it, Mr Gove has, has undertaken formally, uh, as recorded and reflected in the minutes of a formal meeting, that the UK will make payment of that compensation scheme. That said, convener, we've yet to receive confirmation that uh, Mr Gove's commitment will be matched by a Treasury commitment. And we will, over the next weeks and months, press further that commitment but really not from the point of scoring points, but from the point of view of setting up a scheme, discussing it with the, those affected, because we need to do that to get it right, and having it ready to be deployed if, if and I hope it's not, necessary. OK, thank you. OK. Um, the next question, then, is from John Finney. John. You know, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to ask you about the impact of extreme weather events on the agriculture sector. And, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you may be familiar with a, a recent WWF re report which uh, estimates that the extreme weather events in 2018, and you'll recall that that was severe snow in March and uh, higher feeding costs over the summer, uh, that that may have resulted in losses to the agricultural sector of £161 million. Um, can I ask what action the Scottish Government is taking to engage with and support the sector in managing the consequences of extreme weather events? And as an addendum to that, accepting the Scottish Government's position on a climate emergency bill, would you accept that 
This is just one of many reasons why people think there should be a climate emergency bill. Um, well, as to weather impacts, I think uh, Mr Finney is absolutely correct that last year's weather was um, um, had very significant impacts. Um, the, uh, the heavy rain and snow at the end of February increased the numbers of fallen stock, uh, and uh, the late spring resulted in delays to the growing season for arable farmers. Straw and fodder remained in, in short supply, and the lack of growth in grass in the spring meant that... Um, there was a need to source more expensive feeding. Um, there was also, in some farmers, uh, I think, talked about not being able to get their cattle out in the fields early enough, and they had to therefore use more of their uh, bought-in feed supplies reserves. Um, and this all has potentially had knock-on effects because, you know, if, if animals are not fed up as they're fed to the desired level, then that reduces their value in subsequent year in this year. Compounding to that, um, the, the uh, very dry, sunny weather over the summer um, uh, meant that the problems were compounded and exacer exacerbated with the lack of water. And I think in areas particularly such as the Northeast Convener, this is a, maybe a, still a, a factor that is, uh, we have to bear very much in, in mind. So all in all, um, uh, you know, the farmers around the table will, will understand these things from their own work more than better than I do, but, but I've had countless discussions with farmers, all of whom have said that last year was particularly difficult for them in trying. Uh, and therefore, although the Scottish Government doesn't have the budgetary capacity to, to, to compensate for weather-related losses, it's simply just not possible. I mean, we have to be quite candid about that and not be mealy-mouthed and pretend that we can do things which are beyond the ken of any government. That's just not really feasible, I'm afraid. But we did respond to the situation in a measured, proportionate uh, and direct way. We did set up a fallen stock scheme um, with, of £250,000. We donated some additional funding to the Royal Scottish Agricultural Benevolent Society, whom I met again in the last uh, couple of months, and to do terrific work uh, reaching out directly to individual farmers who are perhaps isolated and under real pressure. Um, and we also set up a, a national um, rural mental health uh, forum um, chaired by Jim Hume, formerly a member of, of this place. Uh, and that's a joint uh, initiative between myself and Claire Hockey, the mental health minister. These are very serious matters and ones that I've raised with Mr Gove uh, and you know, without being duly, unduly alarmist, uh, suicide is a serious problem within the farming community in Britain, I'm afraid, and one must be alert to the fact that additional pressures can only increase the risks of loneliness, isolation, uh, a feeling of helplessness, of uh, the kind of situation where people do really feel under massive pressure. So I'm very keen to see that we can continue to do what in practice we can, working with the grain. Our SABI do a good job. They're there. They provide the service. Uh, the last thing I should say is that the weather advisory panel, which we set up, will meet again as and when needed. And it worked with farmers to find practical solutions. And you know, I, I shouldn't underestimate the extent to which farmers have learned from the difficulty and used the lessons to change their practices uh, in order to deal with the situations that arise. Um, Mr Finney mentioned a, a, the approach of a climate emergency um, bill, was it? Um, I mean, that, that I think is really something for Miss Cunningham to take uh, forward. Uh, of course, I'd be happy to hear the, the arguments for that and take part in those discussions internally. but. Um, just to conclude, this is an extremely serious matter, and I think we all uh, are um, keen that governments can do everything that we can do, uh, recognising that there are some things, I'm afraid, that we really just can't do. Uh, I'm grateful for that detailed response, Cabinet mm -hmm. Secretary, and, and would align myself with your comments about the support that's put in place for um, uh, agricultural workers, indeed others in the rural sector, and the, the good work done by the Benevolent Association. You said that these exchanges were candid. Can I assume, therefore, that you will have said to the sector 
that unless things are radically changed, they can expect further episodes of this nature. I, I think, I, think I, I mean, I might be wrong here, but I think the, the, the candour I was referring to was the way I expressed my views to Mr Gove. <laughs> In fact, there's a dead certainty that, that I would have been candid in expressing my views to Mr Gove. Uh, I wasn't um, thinking about the climate change uh, uh, or climate emergency aspect of that, but um, I mean, I, I certainly do agree that it's an extremely serious problem, and therefore, you know, any potential ways in which we can address that in practice are, are ones that I would support considering. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Jamie Green. Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Secretary, can I move on to the issue of uh, your forestry strategy? Um, you recently said, and I could quote you as saying, forestry and farming should go hand in hand, and we are determined that the smaller guy gets more of the cake. Cabinet Secretary, who is the smaller guy and what is the cake? <laughs> well, there's lots of smaller guys, I, I guess, and uh, we want to help them all. Um, I mean, first of all, we we have our new forestry strategy. It was laid in Parliament. It uh, was a, uh, a large piece of work, um, and I, I think it was, uh, brought, had buy-in from, from most or all stakeholders. The next stage is to move on to an implementation plan. Um, but in the meantime, we have been working extremely hard to uh, support a number of initiatives a, in agri-forestry, in forestry and croft land, in community forestry, uh, also supporting smaller businesses that are involved uh, through harvesting and processing grants which support small-scale SMEs, for example, the Association of Scottish Hardwood Sawmillers, the Scottish Woodlot Association and the Woodland Croft Partnership. Um, and I know that the take-up of um, forestry grants under the Main Forestry Grant Scheme uh, ha has been quite high from applicants with smaller projects. In fact, the statistics indicate that from April 15 to October 18, 50% or 11,884 hectares of the total approved area came from schemes under 50 um, hectares. And of the last point I make, convener, is that in order to help the smaller guy, the grant funding per hectare for, uh, is, is typically much higher for small scale projects than for larger projects. And that is quite deliberately to bring forward and encourage and enhance the number um, uh, of applications from smaller landowners or, or others who wish to um, have an element of forestry in their farm, for example. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned the forestry strategy. I think that was published in February of this year. In the strategy, it says that uh, within 12 months of laying the strategy before the parliament, uh, the government will publish a more detailed implementation, monitoring and reporting framework. Could you outline when we ought expect to see that detailed strategy? Uh, yes, I can. We'll publish it by April next year, uh, one year after the laying of the strategy approximately. The plan will include milestones, indicators and a reporting schedule. We'll also establish a national stakeholder group involving key forestry stakeholders to advise on the plan and support on the implementation of the strategy, but I want to stress that at the moment there's a power of work being done anyway. Um, you know, we, we have implementation at the moment. We have a huge amount of activity, uh, very good activity in forestry across the, the whole range. Um, but the new forestry bill with complete devolution as at the beginning of April um, allows us to do even more and to work more closely together to deliver that across all the directorates and public agencies involved. Thank you. Peter, you want to just, uh, just to follow up on that, Kevin, secretary, we know that the, the plan is to go from 10,000 hectares to a year to 15,000. I think I read someplace in the, in the recent past that you had commented that you might be able to go to even 18,000 hectares per year. Is that, is that something, is that, is that your, your, your aim, your, your, your stated aim, that you would like to increase even further? Well, I always like to surpass expectations as uh, members know. Um, but the, the, I mean, the precise formal position is that our existing target is 10,000 hectares, and we should ascertain around June, I think, whether or not we've met that target. Um, I think that the signs are, are promising. Um, that, that target rises to 15,000 by 2025 in steps. Um, 
the 18,000 figure a, a, a comes from CONFOR. CONFOR recently um, a set out uh, an, uh, details of their ambitious proposals where across the UK there would be an increase in, in forestry, both for economic and climate change reasons. Uh, and as I, I understand it, their um, allocation to Scotland of this enhanced ambition for forestry is that 18,000 hectares a year should be plantable by 2000. And 30. I think that's the, the state. I welcome that as an aspiration. Um, there is actually no, I mean, there's, there is a, a huge amount of land in, in Scotland. The question is getting the right land for the right purpose and balancing the needs of various type of land usage. That's really the debate. But there is no shortage of potential land suitable for various different types of forestry throughout Scotland, as is evident when one closely studies a map of Scotland. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to a subject we briefly touched on before because there is still some time in hand. Uh, so, Peter, I think yours is the next question on that. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we did. I mean, it's a question of back to fisheries again. Um, there is a legislative target in the common fisheries policy to fish at MSY, maximum sustainable yield, by 2020 for all stocks. Do you think that is a, a reasonable uh, aspiration? It's something that we can achieve? Well, the, the UK, um, fully supported, I should say, by Scottish ministers, has consistently spoken at December Council of its support for speedy, uh, steady progress towards the setting TACs at uh, uh, maximal, maximum sustainable yield levels um, by 2020. At the same time, the UK has consistently and publicly reserved the right to argue for extensions uh, to this target in certain limited uh, limited uh, situations. Um, a, I don't know if Mr. Gibb would like to kind of expand on on that, which might be helpful for the committee. Alan, um, I can very briefly. Um, I, in my um, experience, have yet to find a professional advisor who suggested that meeting um, maximum sustainable yield for all stocks in mixed fisheries, which, such as we have in the, the North Sea and the west coast of Scotland, is um, likely to be easy, far, left, far less achievable. Right? Regardless, the Scottish Government has promoted that in terms of when we set um, catch quotas based on scientific advice. The majority of our um, key fish stocks are, are set on that basis. Um, there are genuine reasons to depart from that. Um, West of Scotland, cod and whiting, and most recently um, the mackerel um, negotiations as well that we did last year. Um, two points I would make for the committee's um, benefit. Um, it should be borne in mind that it's not within the Scottish Government or the UK's gift singularly. A lot of these are done in international um, forums where they are not, so the 2020 target is a CFP target. Our Norwegian colleagues, for example, aren't bound by that. Um, they are bound by international law, which states that you should work towards MSY. It doesn't give a fixed date target, and that's one of the issues actually in the UK Fishers Bill that um, we're working through with our, our DEFRA colleagues. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. You did, uh, Mr. Gibb, you did mention mackerel in your, your uh, response there. I mean, how do you respond to the Marine Stewardship Council's decisions to suspend MSC certification for northeast mackerel fisheries, and, and what's the Scottish Government going to do to improve the situation? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very positive news on that. The the, the negotiating mandate that um, Cabinet Secretary um, approved for me um, to allow us to take a principled approach. The the scientific advice was for a 61% cut. Um, we sought and persuaded and managed to get all parties to accept a 20% cut, which is a principle that's a, it's a constraint um, mechanism. Because the advice was more uncertain, all scientific advice for fish is uncertain, but it was more uncertain than ever before. There were significant issues around environmental factors, um, and we asked for that to be re-benchmarked. That re-benchmarking has taken place. I just heard last night that we're likely to publish revised advice that will move the advice from the advice we had, which was for 320,000 tonnes, um, up to 770,000 tonnes, which confirms the Scottish Government and the Scottish Government's advisors a view that there were errors, it was the right thing to do. Our understanding is that MSC, when they see this published advice, which has been pushed for by the Scottish Government for that very purpose, will hopefully be in a position to re-accredit the macro fishery. And I should just say that the Scottish pelagic fishermen, whilst have been very disappointed about the loss of it, 
haven't been adversely affected as the accreditation was lost to all parties, not just not just Scottish fishermen. So very positive news on that on that point. Okay, I mean, I I, I, I reflect. I think the industry, the the, the fishermen at the, the sharp end, have always said that the scientific advice was 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 very suspect, and they they were seeing you know good good. Uh, <coughs> Good shoals of mackerel fish out out, in the, out there when they were out and working, and you've, you've basically confirmed that as the, the advice has changed. The the revised advice is, is going to change considerably, and we always work very closely with our stakeholders. They are the people who know um, best firsthand what's happening out there. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, the next question is from uh, Stuart Stuart Stevenson. Um, one of the big changes in uh, fishing, of course, has been the introduction of the discard ban. And I wonder if the Minister could update us on the Scottish Government's view of how that is going and what improvements uh, are being sought uh, or explored. Well, obviously, the, the discard ban is, uh, has a number of challenges, not least the buy-in from the industry, uh, uncertainty around levels of compliance, and in particular, the so-called choke species issue which have the potential significantly to limit fishing activity because of the lack of available quota in the system, as Mrs. Stevenson well knows. We're addressing these challenges and have been addressing these challenges for some time on a number of fronts, including you know, working very closely with uh, POs, with industry representatives, uh, to develop practical solutions, such as, for example, uh, quota pools for undersized fish. At the recent um, December, Council, as Mr Stevenson well knows, we prioritised finding solutions for choke risks associated with low or zero total allowable catch stocks. Um, and uh, we, we, we are working on a whole range of, of uh, potential solutions, uh, not least for West of Scotland cod and uh, whiting. Um, um, we also continue to support the use of remote electronic monitoring as the most effective way of monitoring and enforcing the landing obligation and continuing to press other member states to create the level playing field needed to introduce this. In other words, um, fishermen in Scotland wouldn't thank us if they had to abide by this, but other foreign vessels fishing in the, in the UK waters were not subject to the same rules. That would be an unlevel playing field and plainly unfair. So it's one of these situations where... I think it's in principle easy to, to recognise that uh, remote electronic monitoring has a role to play, but everybody needs to abide by the rules here if it, if it is to have, uh, have buy-in from the industry and, indeed, the desired effect. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you referred to other member states and the activities of um, their fishermen in our waters, and I think that goes to the heart of many of the concerns that fishermen have always had more broadly about the common fisheries policy. So I very much welcome a piece of secondary legislation that came through as part of the Brexit activity that shows that foreign vessels will require a locally issued uh, licence to fish post-Brexit. Uh, but more generally, are we moving to a position where it may be possible to get foreign vessels that are fishing in our territorial waters um, conforming to the same rules as our local fishermen, because that is, in this area, in discards, the current focus, but it's been a focus across a whole range of different areas. Is there anything possible or happening on that? Well, you, Mr. Seems absolutely right that this is, a, that this is what is, is required. There can't be one set of rules for Scottish fishermen that are draconian, uh, whereas foreign vessels are, are not required to abide by these rules, and that wouldn't work. It would be a recipe for disaster, and therefore it's not something that we can advocate. But at the same time, we do want sustainable fishing to uh, as a central part of our discussion paper, uh, and increasingly society expects there to be, rightly so, sustainable fisheries. Uh, and therefore, uh, remote electronic monitoring equipment, which is being taken up in some fisheries, um, for example, scallops, uh, is something which has a role to play. With regard to the specific um, technical aspects about how this is done in practice with regard to licensing of foreign vessels, maybe Mr Gibb could enlighten the committee here. Alan. Um, yep, yeah, just got the signal very briefly. Yes, um, if we are out of the EU under Brexit, there will be, uh, equivalents will be delivered, there will be a requirement for um, all non-UK vessels in UK waters, Scottish waters, to have a, an is a license issued. That will require them to abide by all of the same rules that any Scottish fisherman 
um, does. Cabinet Secretary is on record as committing to cameras on board initially our pelagic vessels when that equivalence point is is available and we'll, we'll take that forward. <laughs> Meanwhile, in, in the CFP and the EU, we're working with the regional groups to try and ensure that equivalence is, is done. We're working on a discard reduction ban, collectively applied by all member states in the west coast of Scotland for cotton whiting and for that equivalence point, very challenging and very difficult to do. Um, but if it's a standard rule within the CFP, all, all member state vessels have to apply, apply it. Um, if it's a domestic rule, that's the, that's the issue around equivalence. But under Brexit, as Mr Stevenson pointed out, licensing will deliver that equivalence for us, yes. Brief follow-up from Jamie. Thanks, uh, Convener. I, I think, uh, notwithstanding my or the Cabinet Secretary's views on, on Brexit, uh, do you think leaving the CFP will be a good thing for Scottish fishermen? And, and I'm not making any political points, but do you, leaving the structures of CFP, do you think that will present any positives? Well, we've always opposed the CFP and indeed uh, uh, the, the compromise proposals that we put forward um, now more than two years ago as part of the Brexit debate uh, recommended that we, we continued uh, members of the Single Market and Customs Union, but we come out of the CFP. And that, those were our proposals at the time, Convener. Um, you know, what I would say is that the, the CFP has caused real problems for the fishing communities over the years. Uh, especially in the past, but now the, the choke species issue and the way in which it's tackled is, is an example of where I think there's frustration not just on, on the part of Scotland and the UK, but in the councils that I've attended, just about every maritime state expressed extreme concern about the handling of the choke species issue because they were coming at it from the same angle that there are, with a more flexible approach, ways of tackling it effectively and sustainably. So, um, a, yes, there are disadvantages. But the other thing I would say is that, you know, the, the settlement that we, we've achieved in, in Europe two years ago, for example, was very, very favourable to Scotland. We did, we did uh, thanks largely to the work of Mr Gibbon and his team, we were able to, Im to influence the UK's approach and negotiation in a positive fashion and get outcomes where we saw a very satisfactory result. So it's not all a complete disaster. Uh, you know, there's a tendency to, uh, to be um, uh, a little bit kind of monochrome about analysing this. And I would say also that it's not clear what is going to replace the European Maritime Fisheries Fund. Uh, we know that it's going to be replaced by something called the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. That's four words, but other than those four words, we know nothing. There was to be a consultation last year on that, 218. That was shelved, and we're told it's going to be coming forward some unspecified date. The real point is that, you know, as, I, um, as I've learned when I've visited uh, ports such as Peterhead, Fraserborough, Scrabster, Eyemouth, uh, uh, and many others, the MFF has actually played a very positive part. Uh, and it's not part of the CFP, but it's part of the EU. Uh, and the workforce issue, the EU workers, well, if we lose all these workers, as Ryan Scatterty said, a fish processor from the North East, who, who I know a, a bit and have visited and spoken to, uh, he says uh, you can have all the fish in the world, but it's not much use if you don't have the workers to process them. So there is that aspect as well. It's not a single issue. It's a multifaceted picture. And I think we, you, you know, without risking going on and on, conveners, you know I don't like to do that at all. <laughs> Uh, we, we need to consider things in the round. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And the uh, final question is from Rich Lau. Richard. Yes. Cabinet Secretary, final question. Um, uh, fisheries protection vessels. Royal Navy, uh, has been said, is boosting the fishery patrol fleet ahead of UK exit from the EU. Welsh Government ha has announced the names of new fishery protection v uh, vessels. Last year, you were actually asked by my colleague John Finney about the preparedness of the Marine Scotland, particularly in regard to fishery protection. So, are you happy with the number and adequacy of the fishery protection vehicles that are, uh, vessels, sorry, that will be available to Marine Scotland following the UK exit from the EU? Well, Mr. Lyle raises a very important point, and as part of our No Deal planning and our commitment to protect the interests of our businesses and including fishery, uh, 
fisheries vessels and coastal communities, we have taken steps to maintain and enhance our marine compliance capabilities and ensure the maintenance of law and order at sea. And, you know, this is a, an issue that I think is, uh, is extremely important and has been considered by, by many. And this is not, is it, this has included, the work that we're doing has included not only tendering for an additional inshore patrol vessel, but also securing a significant increase in aerial capabilities to patrol the Scottish zone and in order to deter illegal activity and a programme of refits, uh, convener, has also been undertaken to ensure that existing uh, assets are capable of doing more, of meeting potentially increased demands upon their time and effort. Um, so, yes, this, this is uh, an important area, and we're doing the, out the steps that, that we're taking, I've outlined, and we're keeping it closely under review. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary and your team, Alan, Mike, David, Andrew, and John, for the for the evidence that you've given uh, this morning. I'm not going to suspend the meeting. I'm going to move straight on to the next item. So, if I could ask witnesses to leave quietly, thank you again for the evidence you've given. Uh, we are going to move straight on to agenda item two, which is subordinate legislation. This item is to consider two negative instruments as detailed in the agenda. I would remind the committee that no motions to annul or representations have been received in relation to these instruments. I would ask if anyone has any uh, comments or recommendations to relating to these instruments. John. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. I, I read with great interest, and, and whilst I have no issue with the, the content or direction, I was somewhat... Well, I was very impressed with the comprehensive nature of the supporting documents. There was impact tests for Scottish firms, competition, consumer... Um, legal aid, digital, all sorts. But although there was specific mention in the documents about um, Shetland, there wasn't an island's impact assessment. Now, I accept that it may be that that's not yet in place or seen to be in place, but it would be a good example of where, given the comprehensive nature, some additional comment. I wonder could we write to the Scottish Government about that um, to establish, if, first and foremost, if there should have been one, and perhaps secondly, to commend them doing everything possible, excepting the heavy workload, to put one in place for anything future between now and the time when it does require to be one, if that's the case. John, thanks very much. I, I think it's very appropriate, because we were the committee that went through the Island Bill, to actually write to the government and ask, should there have been one, and, and suggest that, that having passed and enacted the legislation, it, it would perhaps be appropriate in the future for this, this committee to consider. Does the committee agree that we, we should do that? Yes, and on. On the basis that we do that, are you happy that, that there are no further recommendations in relation to these instruments? That's agreed then, and that therefore concludes today's committee business. Thank you very much, and I now close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>